we get caught up in life circumstances and situations that go on, and we forget we have a God that loves us and never stops loving us. I hope that you'll just keep that, you know, grasp under that. Don't ever let go of that. Let, let, let that enrich you. Let that just, you know, motivate you and all into, into serving and the loving him back. Matthew chapter 5, if you'll turn over there. Don't know how much voice I'm going to have today, just recovering from the sickness this last week. But um, I'll trust the guys in the back that if they need to turn me up, then I'm sure they can do that over there on the other microphones and such. But uh, good to see you. Appreciate you being here. Yep, Daryl's got his hymn book. Maybe I don't want to tell you to use that if you need to. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 5, we're continuing with the living principles from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And um, up to this point, and actually we'll see it, you know, as we go through the entire sermon, but Jesus is dealing, he's uh, focusing a lot on attitudes, all right? Because it is attitudes that pre precipitate actions, all right? The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And also, Christ is dealing with the attitudes that we need to make sure are right and everything, so that way our actions are right. Because he tells us, you know, if there are certain attitudes that go unchecked, and all the dire consequences can come, right? If you remember about the anger, you know, you get so angry, you know, at, at a person to where, you know, just kind of that blind rage, well, what's going to be the next step and everything? That is to do harm, you know, or do irreparable harm, even to the place of killing. You know, and that's why Jesus is saying, look, you got to check the insides. you got to check the attitude, all right? And everything before, you know, to, so make sure that the actions are going to be right. Now, in this portion of Scripture that we're looking at today, Matthew uh, 5, 27 through 32, basically Jesus deals with two um, central themes here. One is managing impure thoughts, all right? Managing impure thoughts. We're going to read about that here in just a moment. And then... He's going to deal with the subject of divorce. All right? You know, when, when, when we look at church today, uh, we often hear, you know, we want the whole counsel of God preached, right? You know, I mean, that's what, we, that, that's what we claim. You know, we want the whole counsel of God preached, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, cover to cover and such and like that. But sometimes there's some subjects that, you know, what just wish the preacher wouldn't mess with, you know, and just kind of stay away from you know, because the, let, let's face it and everything, there are things in the Word of God, and the Word of God, it, the Word of God is not designed to make you feel bad, okay? I want you to understand that. It's not designed to make you feel bad. However, the Word of Whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. All right, let's look, um, <clears throat> let's kind of set a little bit of groundwork here on you know, what Christ is dealing with. First of all, you know, he is going to deal with the subject of marriage. All right? Marriage has taken uh, a couple different terms in our culture today, hasn't it? <clears throat> One thing that we need to realize is that it was God and not government that designed marriage. Okay? We get a hold of that this morning? 
It is God and not government that designed marriage. God designed marriage to be one man, one woman, one lifetime. All right? That's exactly the way he put it in there. Now, I understand, look, I, I understand how things go. We live in a fallen society. We are imperfect beings, and all imperfect beings are going to have imperfect relationships. And I understand, you know, those things that, those things that happen. But really, my job is to deliver the Word of God, okay? I mean, it's right there in front of you. You know, it's for you to look at it. You do with it what you want to, but I've got to put it out there, all right? And so I hope that you'll understand that this morning, that, you know, the message that I'm going to deal with is not meant to offend anybody. I'm not here to hurt anybody. I'm not here to make you feel bad if you've gone through a divorce or anything like that, such as like that. That's not my purpose here. But listen, we need to let the Word of God stand, Amen. Oh, we need to let the word of God stand. Amen. 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 I mean, if it's the word of God, then it's the word of God. It's not going to change, is it? No matter what you think, no matter what your situation may be, it's not going to happen. The word of God is the word of God, and it is going to be there, you know, for eternity. So I, I just want I just want you to understand as we go and in, go into this portion of the scripture. So let's look first of all at what we read. Jesus is talking about controlling impure thoughts, okay? Now, when he said about looking upon a woman and everything, he quantified that by saying about to lust after her. In other words, Jesus is not condemning somebody and saying, man, so-and-so's got an attractive wife. You know, she dresses really, really nice and everything, and he's fortunate to have her. Or, you know, that lady, you know, working behind the well, and she's got beautiful hair. And that, that, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about fixing your gaze, man, upon somebody who's not your wife, and I think for the purpose of being impure with that woman, okay? That's what Jesus is warning against, because he says, if that is not checked, then just like anger, if anger is not checked, what's going to happen, okay? This is going to happen over here. What's going to happen if this isn't checked? Then the act's going to follow, you see. The act is going to follow. So let's look at that here. If the impure thoughts are not controlled, what then is going to happen? Well, number one, it's going to give excuse to sin rather than stop sin. We're going to start making excuses for sin, you see? I heard a pastor say one time, and uh, you know, I was a young pastor also, you know, I kind of laughed at it and thought it was cute. Then after a while, I got to think, I said, well, you know what, that's really not very kosher. You think about it, but he made the comment Everything uh, when it comes to, you know, he was married and such like that as far as, you know, looking and all. And he made this comment. He said, just because you're on a diet doesn't mean you can't look at the menu. And that sounded kind of cute, okay, if you stop and think of it. But what he was, what was doing, it was just an excuse to say, you know, because he was looking at places he should not have been looking, all right, and in ways that he should not have been looking, all right. So the thing is... Is if we do not check these impure thoughts, it just gives us an excuse to sin rather than to stop sinning. Number two, it destroys marriages. How many marriages have we known that have been destroyed because of infidelity? You know, because of these things that take place, you know, and like that, that are left unchecked. You know, and then a marriage is left in ruins, you know, or a family is left in ruins because of this, because of the hurt, because of the breach of trust that comes as a result of that. We understand. Marriages can be destroyed. Number three, if these uh, if these um, uh, thoughts are not uh, brought into check, then deliberate rebellion against God's word. God says, "Don't do it." Okay, if God says, "Don't," then don't. Amen. I mean, is that the way it's supposed to be? No. Now again, I understand. We struggle. Okay, we're human. We struggle. Issues and such like that, I get that whole thing. But listen, folks, if the, if the Word of God is a lamp in our feet and light into our path and everything, then it's got to be good for something. We've got to put it to use. You see, if it's just something to sit on the table or to sit in the car and say, oh, yeah, I have a Bible, it's not doing any, you any good. But God's Word will guide you through whatever situation you may be facing in life. God's Word will guide you. And it's up to us get into that work. And then also, if these, uh, if, if these feelings are left unchecked, then others will be hurt also. 
Now, I want you to understand this. Sin always has its innocent bystanders. Do you understand that? Sin always has its innocent bystanders. Somebody sits back and says, man, I'm, this is just me. It's not hurting anybody else but me. No, let me tell you something. There are innocent bystanders down the road. I've got a friend up in Ohio that I've known for years. And all. And um, uh, served faithfully in church together. We served on the bus route together, sang in the choir together, acted in the youth group together. I mean, just one thing after another. And everything. But he decided to go one path. I went a different path. And all. And now here he is in his early 60s and everything. And he's in and out of the hospital and everything because of cocaine or addiction. You know, and he'll tell you, he says, I ain't hurt anybody else but me. But he's got a wife that's hurt. He's got a son that's hurt. He's got grandkids that want their grandpa, but they don't have him because of the drugs. You see. So don't sit back and say, hey, this is just me. This is just my sin and all. No, there are no innocent bystanders. Your sin hurts others. Right. You understand that this morning? Yeah. Your sin hurts others. Right. And so we need to understand everything. If we do not check our attitudes, dear friend, by the word of God, allowing the spirit of God to shepherd us through those times, Everything that actions are going to follow is going to end up hurting not only you, but it's going to hurt others around you also. And then you might remember, <coughs> excuse me, how many of you remember the Andy Griffith show? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Who was Andy's sidekick? Barney. Barney. Barney, yeah. You remember the one episode and everything that where, where Barney, he was encouraged? I can't remember the situation, but something was going on. And Barney told him, Andy, you got to dip it in the mud. Dip it in the mud. I can't talk like Barney. Yeah, I can't talk like that, Barney. Right? Right? You all got to that, right? Andy, you got to dip it in you know. the mud. And that's what, you know, Jesus that's what, is talking you know, about Jesus when, is talking when he's dealing with the issue, when he's dealing with of, the issue uh, of your eye and your hand. Your eye and okay, your hand. Okay, now Christ is not like in any way supporting the mutilation or physical body. Right? Because after all, right? our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, we know Amen. that. Amen. Okay, we know that. Go back to the Bible. Go back to the Bible. Uh, first, God's the Spirit uh, is in the tabernacle. Is in the tabernacle. And then on the day of Pentecost, and then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit began inhabiting each and every believer in our body. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he is not about teaching his temple in any way, shape, or form. But what he is doing and everything. Notice there, he talks about the eye, if it offend. Well, where do the lustful desires begin? Begin by what you see, okay? By what you see, by what your eye beholds. And then, if that is not checked, the hand, action, is what follows. So basically what Jesus is saying here, you got to nip it in the bud. Okay, you got to start bringing those things under control, bring them under the control of the Holy Spirit. After all, the Bible does tell us to be in, under the Holy Spirit, amen? Be filled with the Spirit of God. That way you'll not fulfill what? The lust of the flesh, okay? If we are seeking the filling of God's Spirit each and every day, all right? And we must do that on a daily basis, I believe. I don't think you can just sit back and one day say, okay, Lord, fill me. And then that lasts you the rest of your life. You know, I think there's many, many fillings of the Holy Spirit of God, and we have to we have to ask that. We have to request that and everything to be filled with the Spirit of God, and that way we do not, you know, we do not entertain the lust of the flesh. And then Jesus deals in the rest of that chapter, beginning in verse 31. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery. So let's look at this subject of divorce for just a moment. And again, <clears throat> this is not to make anybody feel bad in any way, shape, or form. Um, I'm very blessed, very fortunate. That I've, I've got a wonderful lady that's decided to stay with me through thick and thin and this coming may we'll been married 43 years 44 years you know we've been married and so um 44 years to my first wife you know that's a good thing enjoy that and um you know she had some good examples in her background her mom and dad were married for 60 years 
before her father passed, and then she had a uh, set of grandparents that were married for 70 years, you know, before one of them passed, you know, so there are some good examples there. Unfortunately, my side wasn't that good. My mom and dad didn't have all that great of luck when it came to lasting relationships and everything, so in a lot of ways, she, you know, her and I winged it and everything, but we just knew that, you know, God put us together and you're supposed to stay together, and through shape or form. So let's uh, look at this for just a moment. In Scripture, <clears throat> there are three writers that deal with the subject of divorce. Moses, Christ, and the Apostle Paul. Moses, obviously, you go back to the Old Covenant, Deuteronomy 24, and then Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 quotes from Moses and everything and is talking about that writing and divorcement. Now you have to understand, and everything, you have to understand the cultural ramifications here, and everything that the Jewish people at the time, while they were Jews, you know, as far as a nation, so to speak, goes, culturally they were Egyptians. They had been in Egypt for 400 years. They had ado adopted those Egyptian customs, been become very much like them, and basically making a sham of marriage and divorcing for just about anything you can imagine. Matter of fact, if a man came home and the wife didn't fix the right kind of meal and everything, he could divorce her. Okay, if she didn't he want like he wanted it to and everything, he could divorce her. You know, this is what it was talking about for any cause, okay, can for any cause, such as like that. And the way that was done is that whatever that cause was, and all he would write that in a writ, Witnessed by two, because the law demanded it had to be at least two or more witnesses, witnessed by two, he would go up to the wife and say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and things over. It's done. She's out, you see. That's kind of pretty cruel, wasn't it, back then? But the Bible said that Moses did that because of the hardness of the people's heart. Okay? They did not see marriage as God had designed marriage, but basically they saw it as the Egyptians okay, saw marriage to be. And so he said that, <clears throat> then for the hardness of your heart, however, Jesus went, would go on to say of what Moses said, that it is not so from the beginning. In other words, God did not intend for divorce to separate man and a woman. He did not intend it. But for the hardness of their heart, and you know, under Moses' law, then they had allowed that. But it was not so from the beginning. As we mentioned, one man, one woman, one lifetime. And one thing also I want you to understand that marriage is a picture, okay? It is a picture of God's covenant relationship with his church. Can we go like that? Because Christ is referred to as the bride, what? Groom. And the church is referred to as the bride, okay? So there's your marriage connotation right there. And, everything, and the relationship, that covenant relationship between Christ and his bride, okay? That is to be an eternal covenant, Okay, based on him. And so we see that he did not intend for there to be kind of separated. However, in all culture being what it is, you know, imperfect people, what we are, those things do happen. Now, Jesus here in our text, he addresses it. And, and I'm not going to get into a, a, a lot of things here because really this is a subject that needs very careful um, uh, preparation. It needs it needs time. You know, this is something to spend time in, you know, not just, you know, five minutes to say, hey, here we got it. And all simply because we do need to understand how it is in our culture today. So Jesus said, yeah, Moses said over here for, for any cause, he said, however, I'm telling you 
that except for sexual immorality, okay, you don't put her away. Except for sexual immorality. And we're not talking about a one-time thing either. We're talking about a pattern. When this has become a pattern within that marriage and everything, then yes, God grants a divorce to be given. All right? He grants divorce. Matter of fact, that is the only way, you know, that we see what Jesus is saying here, that he recognizes divorce of any kind if there is sexual immorality within, within the context of the marriage. And then he goes on to say here, it causes her and everything. When you do that, it causes her to commit adultery. How is that? Well, again, culturally speaking and everything, unmarried and single women were often in destitute positions and often stigmatized because they were divorced. Now, some of you might be able to remember, you know, I was just a kid and everything, but my mother was divorced in the late 50s and everything from my father and such. And, you know, like I said, just a kid, but growing up, you know, I can remember people talk about divorcee. Remember that? Oh, she, she's a divorcee and everything. And there's a stigmati- stigmatization about that, you see. I mean, in our culture now, there's not. But there used to be. There used to be somebody who is divorced. Ooh, maybe... Maybe we don't want them being part of our group. And I think she, she's divorced, you know. It didn't make any difference if the man was divorced. It seemed like it was the woman for the stig- stigmatization come in, okay? And so this was kind of a cultural thing that was going on here, and it placed a woman in a very precarious position because of that, for her livelihood, and also because of her reputation. And then he goes on to say that if you take one who is divorced, that's adultery too, Okay? That's adultery too. Now we could get into you know v- various different things on that, but right now and everything, I, I, I don't feel it's a time and place. We're just trying to deal with what you know the scripture portion is for today. But here's one thing I do know: we live in a throwaway society, don't we? And if they, your microwave goes bad, what do you do? Toss it. Flat screen goes bad, what do you do? You toss it. I mean, that's just the way everything is. Nothing's made, to, nothing's made to be repaired. It's all made to be replaced. And sadly, marriage is much the same way. And all matter of fact, many younger people today, you know, uh, we understand many young, younger people today are opting out of marriage, oftentimes because they've seen what their parents went through or even their grandparents went through, and they say, I don't want that, you know. So they'll just build a life, they'll move in with somebody, they'll have children together, they'll buy a house together, they'll do their jobs together, but they always leave that back door open, you see. Lack of commitment by being married, you see, by going through the marriage. And that way the idea is, hey, if it doesn't work, then we can always, you know, we can always back out. Instead of, man, this is a commitment we have made for a lifetime, okay, this is who God wants me to be with, you see. And I know I'm kind of talking to the choir here. Many of you have been married. How many of you have been married um, over 30 years? Let me see. Okay. How, have you been, how many have been married over 40 years? Okay. Anybody in here married over 50? Wow. How about 60? Okay. Well, bless our Miss Brewer. Uh, how about 55 years? 55, wow, bless your heart. Amen. Well, let me tell you something and everything. You are the exception, okay? You are the exception. No, not the rule any longer. And so, you know, hopefully that's encouraged to some of these younger ones and everything. And look and say, hey, we got a chance, you know? <laughs> but uh, with some of the younger couples and all can see, hey, you know what? That's an encouragement to us and everything. We can see these things and all and um, know that we have, we have a chance. We have hope in there. But, yeah, just uh, nothing's designed to be rebuilt, just replaced. And marriage, it seems, is no longer is also, you know, included in that. And then Paul, in Romans 7 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and all, he also deals with the subject of marriage. He kind of puts it all together. He takes what, what Moses gave. He takes what Christ came along with, and he just kind of just fills it all out. And again, that would be a time, of, uh, a time for study you know, at a later date and everything because he, he deals primarily 
what Paul stresses and everything is that the only break of the marriage bond is death. Okay? The only break of the marriage bond is death. All right? So when death breaks that bond, death, when one, one or the other spouse is up, the other one is free to marry. Okay? It's free to marry. But um, these are things that, you know, we need to look into the Scripture. He deals with de uh, such as a abandonment and departing and everything and, and divorce and many other things that we just can't deal with right now. Uh, time is not going to permit here. So what do we see? What do we take all this and we close it up today and all the things? What are we looking at? Our unchecked attitudes will always claim innocent bystanders. All right? Get a hold of that. Our unchecked attitudes will always claim innocent bystanders. All right? We've got, to, uh, we've got to check anger. We've got to check lust. We've got to check all these things that well up from within because if not, the action is going to follow. And when those actions take place, that's when you start having casualties, okay? That's when you start having casualties falling along the side and other thing. So um, I hope that you got a little bit out of uh, this morning. I can tell I'm just, you know, barely hanging on here a little bit. But um, I appreciate your attention and everything, and I would encourage you for next week and everything, go ahead and begin.